Okay, so we're going to talk through a very common statistical technique known as the chi-square test. So before we talk about how the chi-square works, what it does mathematically, and how you would interpret it, I think it's important to begin with sort of the basics of sampling, right? Sampling is where we draw, ideally by random, a subset of cases or observations and use that to make an inference basically a conclusion about what's going on in a larger population. So we use this commonly with uh, public opinion polling, right? And so you've probably seen polls that show, you know, approval or disapproval for presidents or who people are likely to vote for. And again, all of these are taking a subset of people, ideally at random, because that would give us the most accurate results, um, and trying to say something about the larger population. But here's what we know about random samples. They are correct on average, which means if you did the process over and over and over and then averaged all those different samples together, they'd be pretty darn accurate. But any individual sample might bounce around. It might be too high, it might be too low. The good news is that mathematically we can understand that bouncing around about how much samples are likely to be off and we can usually communicate it and, and work with that in, in, a, in a reasonable way. And so you may have seen this margin of error um, statistic that goes along with a lot of public opinion polling. And so if you look at sort of the headline numbers, the big 44, 48 in this poll of President Trump's approval rating, in this fine print it has um, plus or minus 3.1%, which means given what we know about samples and how they bounce around, the numbers that we're quoting you could be off. They could be too high by 3% or they could be too low by 3%. We're just sort of flagging that for you that while we think this is the best number that we have based on the sample that we, we took, samples on average being right can still be off a little bit one way or another. And that's important to keep in mind when interpreting samples. Okay, so that's crash course on statistics. Let's move on to talk a little bit more about the chi-square test and how we would use it. So the chi-square test is typically used for analyzing tables. And so what I have here are a couple different tables looking at the hypothesis that there's a relationship between gender and maybe support for war or behavior in war, a difference between men and women and how they approach international relations, right? So the first table looks at um, support for the Iraq invasion um, back in 2002 among men and women. And you can note that there's a thousand people in the sample. That's that number in the, the bottom right hand corner of that top table. And on the far side, you see that there's 500 men and 500 women. Those are the row totals. So we have a sample that's 50 50 split. And then we can look at the support and oppose column. What we see is that 305 men apparently supported the Iraq War. Um, in November 2002 of the thousand people that were sampled and 280 women supported it. So slightly more men than women, right? And slightly more women than men opposed the Iraq war. And we can see that and we can kind of eyeball it. And because the samples are sort of even, right? 50% men, 50% women, we can look at that and maybe say, oh, it seems like men are, were more supportive of the Iraq war in November 2002. But Things don't always line up so neatly in terms of interpretation with 50-50 male-female split. Um, we could look down at the other table, which is looking at the escalation of international crises into military action, into warfare, um, and the, the gender of the leaders um, that were leading these countries at the time of that crisis, whether they were male or female. And what we see is that there's a heck of a lot more male leaders in our sample of international crises and there are female leaders and that might complicate our interpretation about you know whether or not one is more likely than the other to end up um, escalating a conflict into war. So because tables can be really messy, statisticians have tried to find out ways to maybe quickly look at a table and say, is there a pattern here? Are we seeing differences in terms of where things fall in these different cells? Let me explain how that would work, ma work mathematically. So a chi-square test can give you a statistic that will analyze any table and identify if the distribution of values in the cells, right, so the, the numbers in the support and oppose male, female, those four um, different cells, those four different boxes, if those numbers are different than what we might expect if there was no pattern there whatsoever. So what do we mean by expect? So I'm going to flip back to that, that first table, right, where we talk about how there's 1,000 people, 500 men, 500 women. We, we know that roughly half our sample is men and women. And we know that 
from the column totals that 585 people in our sample said that they support the Iraq war in November 2002. Now, if we know that 585 people support the Iraq war in November 2002, and we know that half our sample is male and half our sample is female, we might expect that half of those 585 people would be male and half would be female. Similarly, in the opposed column, we might expect that half of the four 15 would be male and half would be female. And so we could actually plug in the expected values into each of those four different combinations, right? And so we might expect that for males that oppose the Iraq war, we would see 207.5. Um, and females that oppose the Iraq war would be 207.5. And it turns out that while the numbers are reasonably close, there's fewer men and slightly more women in that opposed column. Okay, so what do we do with that? Well, with the chi-square test, we take that expected idea and we compare it to what we actually see, our observed, and we actually take the difference. We say, how different are these two, um, these two values, what we actually see in our, our table and what we might expect if there was no pattern there whatsoever, if we just sort of filled things in based on what we know about how many people supported and how many people opposed the Iraq war and what we know about how many men and how many women are in the sample, right? So we get that difference. Sometimes that difference is gonna be positive. Sometimes that difference is gonna be negative. We square it, and what that does is it basically takes away the, the negative signs, because if you square a negative number, it becomes a positive number. And then we have to build in that sometimes we have really large samples, right? And if you have a large sample, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, it's gonna be easier to get a big difference than if you have a small sample of maybe 10 or 15 or 20 people. And so almost like, taking an average, what we do with that difference between observed and expected is we divide it by our expected values. And what that ends up doing is it gives us sort of a, a, a normalized or an adjusted value. And we can do that for each and every cell in our table. So each of those four cells, the male support, male oppose, female support, female oppose. And we add up the results of that equation for each of those four cells, and that is our chi-square value. And it looks at that table and says, okay, we see differences in terms of observed versus expected across this table. When we add it all up, how big of a difference is there in this table compared to what we might expect? And so the idea is that bigger values on your chi-square test are going to suggest that there's more of a pattern, right? That something's going on that's deviating um, men and women in terms of their support for the Iraq war or their behavior in crisis escalation. Something's going on. There's probably a pattern. It's not playing out the way we'd expect. And so if we're interested in finding relationships, a big chi-square value is, is great. But that raises sort of an important question. What does a big chi-square value mean? How, how big of a chi-square do you need to be able to say, this is an interesting pattern. There's something here. And there's two things that I think are worth keeping in mind about this. One of those is that the bigger your table is, the more cells you have in your table, we end up calling this degrees of freedom, although there's some math involved to calculate the exact number. Um, the number of cells in your table, as that number gets bigger, it's gonna be easier to find a larger chi-square number because you're adding up more stuff. The second thing to keep in mind is that samples bounce around. Even if there was nothing going on out there in the world, even if the pattern didn't really exist, if there was no relationship between gender and support for the Iraq war, samples can be off by a little bit. That's just normal, samples bounce around. And so how do we know if the bouncing around that we see in our, or if the, the difference we see in our chi-square value, the observed minus the expected, is the result of a real difference or if it's just samples bouncing around? And the way that statisticians typically get at this and, and figure out, is this something that's just randomness and random variation or something real, is that we convert the chi-square into what's called a p-value. Um, mathematically, the way that you would do this is you would take these chi-square curves that you can see over here that change shape based on the number of cells in your table, and you plot your chi-square value, and then you find the area of the curve to the right of that. So basically, what percentage of uh, the time would you end up getting chi-square values that are more extreme than this if things happen by chance. That's the statistical way of thinking about this. Um, I prefer to think about it as um, a function of weirdness. And so bear with me for a second. If I were to flip a coin and call it in the air and say it's gonna land heads and it lands heads, are you impressed by that? 
My guess is probably not, right? Calling a coin in the air is not that unusual of a thing. If I were to have a deck of cards and say, I'm gonna draw a club and I pull a card and it's a club, are you impressed? Well, you're probably gonna do the calculation, say, well, there's four suits in a deck of cards, one in four, 25% chance. No, I'm not impressed. That's, that's, not, that's not something that's all that, that surprising. If I have a deck of cards and I say, I'm going to pull the three of diamonds and I pull the three of diamonds, you're gonna say, whoa, what's the trick? How did you do that? Is this just a deck that's made up all of three of diamonds? Is that how you did that? Something happens between a one in four chance and a one in 52 chance that shifts us from that kind of thing happens all the time to, whoa, something's going on here. There's something weird. And so there's a, a point between that that I call the threshold of weirdness where we cross from, yeah, big deal to, wow. Statisticians set that threshold of weirdness typically at about 5%. A one in 20 chance is considered something really unusual. And so one way to think about the p-value is that when you convert that chi-square value into a p-value, and you will not have to do this, there are lots of statistical programs and there's web applications that will give you that, that calculation for you. But when you get that p-value in return, you can ask yourself, is this probability something that happens normally or are we past that threshold of weirdness, right? And so if you get a chi-square value and you convert into a p-value and that p-value is, let's say, 0.4, that's 40% that's slightly rarer than calling a coin in the air, um, but not really. And so if you see that result 40% of the time, just by random chance, that's not really that, that crazy. That's re not really that impressive. That's something that we could easily explain away with just, just luck or chance or randomness. But if you get a p-value that's really small, let's say 0 0.001 or one in a thousand, that's telling us that the chi-square value that we got and that we're seeing in our table is something that wouldn't just happen by chance, something that's really unusual. It would be like drawing you know, the, the card you call from a deck of cards correctly 20 times in a row. That's a really ridiculously unlikely thing to happen. And so that p-value tells us whether or not we should dismiss our chi-square value as just something that could be explained by randomness or whether we sort of zero in on it and say something's going on in this table that's unusual. So when we interpret the, the chi-square value, we're thinking about two things. We're thinking about how big that chi-square value is and then how likely is that to happen by chance. The smaller the p-value, the greater the likelihood that this is a real pattern, something to pay attention to, something to take note of, and something to report on in your write-up of your statistical analysis.